It's becoming something of a staple for historical Total War games to receive massive standalone expansion packs, or at the very least a follow-up game which is connected to its proverbial mother. Medieval 2 had Kingdoms, Empire had Napoleon, and Rome 2 had Attila, all games which built or continues the eras in some way or another of the ones preceding them. All of these were in my opinion excellent follow-ups, and especially Attila is perhaps my favorite Total War of all time. But there is one standalone expansion which is so legendary, so universally acclaimed, that I'm almost afraid we won't be seeing another like it for some time. And that game is the fall of the Samurai expansion for Total War Shogun 2. And in this video, we'll take a look at exactly why Fall of the Samurai is so amazing. As always, if you enjoyed the video, I hope you leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel. And now, on to a rapidly modernizing Japan. Where Shogun 2 takes place during feudal Japan in the golden age of the samurai swordsmen, bowmen, and of course, the Yaru Yashigaru, Fall of the Samurai skips ahead a few hundred years to the age of new imperialism in the latter half of the 19th century. Not only has the landscape been changed from the fairy tale like environments to something much more realistic, the political landscape has changed as well. Gone are the clans of old, now replaced by larger and more powerful clans and factions. Perhaps most importantly, Western influence is now a big part of the game, where you can interact with the United States, Britain, or France through trade and military ventures. It's an age where the skills and cultures of old are being pushed aside in favor of steel and gunpowder and massive professional armies in more and more centralized states. It is an age overseeing the fall of the samurai and the rise of the Lion Infantry, and we'll return to this battlefield later on. Japan is a fragmented land in 1864. The Japanese clans are divided into two factions, each vying for supremacy. One alliance supports the continued domination of the shogun and the old ways, while the other fights for the supremacy of the emperor. No faction starts as hegemon here, instead, most are made up of around two or three provinces, and might include some alliances which may further your quest for domination. In this tumultuous era, my favorite faction is Sumatsu, because they start at the very western edge of the map, on its own relatively small island, no less. I also just love their dark blue color. It's also a faction focusing on lion infantry and modernized armies, and well, it kinda looks like the one from The Last Samurai. Fall of the Samurai borrows most of its gameplay aspects from Shogun 2, and it's all the better for it. The user interface is beautiful and minimalistic, focused only on the right side of the screen rather than all over. It makes for a better picture overall, as you have so much space for the rest of the world. As the seasons change, so do their effects, and you'll have to take into account things like attrition and food production for when you want to make military moves. This philosophy is extended to the city buildings as well. Cities look realistic, not too massive like in Rome 2, but not as small and cartoonish as in Empire. You have all the information you need at a glance as well. You can see how much money you make, whether your city's wealth is growing or declining, and your city's happiness level. Going deeper, everything from unit cards to city images are so time appropriate and well drawn that it puts the later game's abstract UI designs to shame, and I firmly remain a supporter of having building cards actually look like the building they're portraying, and not some abstract concept like a cow or a gun or an anchor or something. All the financial info you'll more or less ever need is easily found in the city's menus, and I love that you can see the expected growth or decline of each individual city, and that you can change the tax level on a per city basis, which, you know, makes sense. We of course have a diplomacy menu where you see who you're trading with and who's at war and whatnot, and as a series first in Shogun 2, which followed into this expansion, we got an in-depth faction panel where you get an overview of your family and your important generals. Here you can give your commanders important offices which unlock the further you get in the game. Think of it as an early version of the Attila offices, or the office system in Three Kingdoms. As stated, each faction is aligned either with the Emperor or the Shogun, and this alliance impacts your relations with other factions. Ergo, you'll be diplomatically closer to factions with the same goal, and vice versa. You are in essence conquering your enemies for your emperor here, and the more you manage to conquer, the more the emperor will recognize you. You can in the end become the leader of your alliance, and if you are with the emperor, you eventually get a choice to continue fighting for said emperor, or take up the mantle of your own faction and decide to sail your own Japanese sea, so to speak, destroying your relationship with every other faction in the game. It's a sort of different take on the realm divide mechanic from Shogun 2, although rather similar. It is awesome that if you decide to continue to fight and become the Emperor's champion though, your faction banner changes to that of the Emperor. 
This is a wonderful immersive move and I highly appreciate that. What's really awesome and unique to Fall of the Samurai is the fact that your ships are actually useful on the campaign map. By placing them close to ports or cities or armies, you can rain fire down upon them, hopefully taking some cannons or infantry out in the process. And I suppose this brings us to the battlefield, as most actions will in this game. I'll say it right now, the battlefields in Fall of the Samurai are gorgeous. The fields are massive, filled with open areas and defensible positions. But what really makes the battles in Fall of the Samurai is this fusion between old and new, between the traditional and modern. Because not only do we get the epic line infantry era warfare with powerful cannons, massive volley exchanges which light up the field, and even a cannon type which no other historical Total War game has, the Gatling gun, which just decimates anyone who dares approach it. But we also get a taste of the old, of the way of the samurai through katana wearing warriors who will shred through gun carrying noobs, or highly skilled samurai bowmen with high damage arrows shot over a surprisingly long range and who can shoot over hills, so as to not require a straight line of sight like the infantry does. Or what about the samurai cavalry? The options are many, and by combining fire and smoke with sword and arrows, the battlefields of Fall of the Samurai are absolutely stunning. For a historical Total War title, we are given a diversity of troops and fighting styles rarely seen up until the Warhammer games. Only here we get the added sense of realism. Every cannonball and every shot matters, and if you use your cavalry effectively, it's quite possible to turn the tide of battle and roll up a carpet of would-be killers, turning them into a routing mass for you to cut down. Remember those fleets of yours on the battle map that can shoot at towns and cities? Well, if they're in precision, they can also be utilized in the battles for some truly epic scenes, allowing you to bombard the enemy with some massive firepower no lone cannon can muster. You'll have to plan your shots in advance and wait a handful of seconds before you actually see their effect on the battlefield though, so remember to plan your barrages accordingly. And speaking of things that transfers from the campaign map, the units belonging to western nations will also be possible to recruit as soldiers. So either an elite unit of French, English or American unit of line infantry will be recruitable. We also have the siege battles of course. And just like in Shogun 2, the siege battles will feature smaller or larger castles you'll have to scale, and almost never actual cities. The castles are zoomed into different sections, but there are no siege towers or ladders, so every unit except for cavalry can scale walls just by climbing them. What makes sieges difficult though is that they're perfectly made for defending. Your archers and gunmen have excellent firing positions, and your towers are also raining arrows down on the enemy. If you're prepared, and perhaps also wealthy, you can hire a ton of cannons to do most of the heavy lifting for you. Shooting from a distance feels amazing, and a hard-hitting volley just looks so sick, and when it's time to march your army forward, you can really feel proud and confident that the enemy's defenses are severely diminished even before the fighting starts. This is all to say that defenders don't have cannons too, of course, and if they do, well, tough. What the castles attempt to do here is basically make you fight your way from the bottom to the top, and especially is this the case in the larger cities where you have several gates and walls to scale. This can make for some epic battles, but I much prefer the castles and cities of other games like Rome or Medieval, because in Shogun 2 and Fall of the Samurai, I just think these maps look and play very much like each other, and frankly, they're not as much fun to play as the open field battles. They're perhaps more fun to defend than attack, but it all kind of depends on your army and what you're prepared for. We of course also have naval battles, which in Fall of the Samurai are so freaking cool. It's the current year of like 1865, so we are in the process of moving away from the sailboats of the Napoleonic era, and instead deal in large part with steam engines. Now this might make your ship run faster, but it also makes them especially prone to absolute destruction if a fire starts or a particularly mean cannonball hits. Makes for a great sight though, so there's that. Like in Empire or Napoleon, the naval battles work really well. You have two sides to shoot from, and you maneuver your ships so as to best hunt down and bombard the enemy ships. Just like with the battlefield, your chosen western nation will net you a cool ship as well, like the Ironclad which has an immense amount of armor and firepower compared to its more traditional counterparts. Both the sounds and the sights are impressive, and naval battles in Fall of the Samurai really do make the case for the return of a grand seaborne warfare in Total War. So, should you play or even perhaps buy Fall of the Samurai? Especially this long after release? Well, yes, absolutely you should. Follow the Samurai still offers a deep and intense campaign which really demands everything of you from the beginning, and you'll have to manage your thirst for conquest with the capabilities of other factions to send armies and navies your way. 
On the battlefield, few historical Total War games are as dynamic as this one, where we get an awesome mix of firepower and samurai power, making for some truly grand and intense stuff. Fall of the Samurai became one of the better Total War titles when it launched as a standalone expansion back in 2012, and remains one of Total War's finest experiences to date. If you've been looking for a Total War which marries guns and swords, but one which remains a historical title, then I think you just found it. Thank you so much for watching, friends. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you'll consider supporting the channel on Patreon. It would really go a long way. If you find my thoughts useful in any way, I hope you'll leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you next time. Cheers!